Hello, welcome to this webinar on runner's knee. Now, this is probably one of my favorite things to talk about. And so what I want to do over the course of the next 20 minutes or so is just try and educate you in how we can help you to be running further, faster and pain free. I'm sure like me, you will agree that running is so important for both our physical and our mental health. So I hate to see it when people are in pain and they're not able to do the thing they love. And as we know, when it comes to running, unfortunately, this can be linked with some knee pain and can create knee pain. And we, as a result, have this term runner's knee. So over the course of this webinar, I want to be educating you in what actually is runner's knee? What are the conditions that make runner's knee? Why do we get runner's knee? And most importantly, how can we get rid of runner's knee? I'll also be looking to answer the question, is running even bad for our knees? So what I want you to do is just to pop away any distractions for the next 15 or 20 minutes, because what I want to teach you and educate you, I think will be able to allow you to be running pain free and much further and much faster for the rest of your lifetime. So hopefully it can be that helpful. Now, what we're going to do is just pop over into the content and start as we go through. So. So first of all, who am I? Who is this person that you're listening to and, and looking at right now in the bottom of your screens? Well, my name's John White. I'm a head ther the head therapist, sorry, here at my clinics, which are John W. Sports Injury. We are based just outside of uh, London in Kent. Now, I've been working with sporting, sporting injury for well over a decade now. Um, so as a result, I have seen my fair share of runner's knee injuries. But I think perhaps even more important than the work that I've done clinically, for you to be able to sort of understand me and where I'm coming from and why my passion is so strong is that I'm also a key marathon and half marathon runner. So I am somebody who, yes, I work with people every day on helping them to achieve their sporting goals, but I have my own sporting goals of my own. I want to be out there running and I do get injured. I do get frustrated. It is probably my only addiction in life. So what I want to do is be able to help you fulfill those goals and those running ambitions that you have and not let this knee pain be something that has to stop you from running. And I have had runner's knee. Pre being a sports therapist, um, I did suffer runner's knee when I was when I was younger and as I say in the early stages of my education. And that was because I was doing the wrong thing over and over again and it caused me my knee problems during a marathon training program and I wasn't able to do the marathon. Um, and that was so frustrating. The day when I couldn't complete that London marathon, um, it was just one of the most frustrating times. So I truly understand just how frustrating knee pain is. And ever since then, I've vowed to be able to help as many people as I can to get rid of their knee pain. And as a result, I probably treated hundreds, possibly even thousands of cases of knee pain. And these are people that are now back running. It doesn't have to be a thing that stops you running. So what I want to do, first of all, is get rid of some myths to really get take a myth out there that running is bad for your knees. I'm sure you've heard that. And people say to me all the time, John, you're a sports therapist. You know, why are you running as much as you do? Isn't it bad for your knees? Well, what I'm here to tell you is that a lot of the research says differently. And this was one study um, that was done by the Arthritis Care Research who looked into running and they took a case load of people and there were 64, the average age, sorry, of the people in this study was 64 years old. And they looked at it and what they found were that 24% of people were, were, uh, were less likely to suffer with osteoarthritis. So running made, gave people a 24% less chance of suffering osteoarthritis in, in the sort of later stages of life. And they actually found even people that had stopped running but were former runners, had run previously, were 18% less likely. So overall, what it's showing us is that running was dramatically reducing the chances of us developing osteoarthritis. And they say the average age of, this, of these people were 64. So these are, um, you know, these are the conditions that can typically affect us once we start getting above 50, 60 years old. So you may then be sitting saying, well, you're wrong, John, on this one, because I'm a runner and I have knee pain. Well, I am not here to say that if you run, you don't get knee pain. As I say, we wouldn't be on this webinar. I wouldn't be treating the hundreds of thousands of cases that I have treated of runner's knee if running didn't cause you knee pain. So in this study, 33% of the runners did have knee pain. But the important stat to know is that 41% of non-runners also reported having knee pain. So we have knee pain. Knee pain is out there in the society. What we might be doing wrongly is attributing that to running. And that's something that we want to potentially think about and understand as we go through. Because it might not actually be 
the running per se that's causing the problem or the running it that the thing that we should be blaming it's the biomechanics it's the kinetic chain the kinetic chain basically is that is the chain of connected tissues in our body where if we get a breakdown in anywhere along that chain it can cause a problem and we have to remember right from the sort of start of this webinar is that knee joint is a joint that sits in the middle of the neck and what typically happens is it gets beaten up by things around it so what we want to be doing is finding out what's doing the beating up stop blaming the knee and address the actual problem so on that note then what is the knee well as i've said the knee is a joint that sits in the middle of the body okay it's we have the hip joint above it and we have the ankle joint below it and we have muscles attaching into it and crossing it so what we have here are various structures so we have ligaments in the knee now a ligament is something that joins a bone to a bone so in the knee one of the ligaments you might be familiar with is the anterior cruciate ligament or otherwise known as acl so ligaments are there to connect bones to bones we also have tendons. Now, tendons are something that join muscles to bones. So they are the attachment points for muscles that cross the joint and allow them to do the movement. So a typical example of a tendon that you might be familiar with is the Achilles tendon. This joins our calf muscle to the heel and allows the Achilles, the Achilles to create the movement that it does, which is something called plantar flexion. In the knee, we have a big tendon that crosses the front of the knee called the quadriceps or the patella tendon. It has a few different names, but that effectively is the tendon for our quadricep muscle. And it's a very important and um, structure around the knee. We also have our meniscus. Now the meniscus are the blue discs that you can see in between the knee. And really they have a couple of roles. One is to be a shock absorber, um, to absorb shock that's going up into the body. And the second is to allow the surfaces to not rub on each other or allow the joint to be smooth where the two bones meet or the three bones I, I, I should have mentioned in the knee joint that was a point earlier that the, the knee joint is an articulation of bones so we have the femur which is our big thigh bone coming in to meet the tibia and the fibula and that forms the knee joint now if we didn't have our meniscus these end of surfaces would rub on each other and arthritis would be a much bigger problem for us but the meniscus is there to help with that we also have bony articulations. Now, what I mean by that is sort of bony um, lumps, if you want, lumps of bone, which have which act as attachment points. Now, the reason I mention this around the knee is that this is very important because we have a structure called the ITB. Now, as a runner, you may be aware of the ITB. It's, it's what we call fascia. Now, let me just stop on this moment for a second to explain the ITB a little bit more because it's very important for us to understand as us runners. Now, what the ITB is, is this band of fascia, as I mentioned. And what I want you to do is think of muscle as like an onion. So we have the bulk of the onion and that's our muscle. We then have skin around an onion and that's our skin around our bodies. But in between that on an onion, we have this sort of thin layer of plastic. And that's what we have around our muscles. And this is what we term fascia. It's connective tissue that connects all the body. But we, in certain parts, we have thicker parts of this fascia. And the thickest part that we have is what we term the ITB. And this runs down the outside of our leg. It runs from our hip to the outside of the knee joint. It actually attaches into what's called your fibula head, which is the bony bit on the, on the outside of the fibula that you, that you may see there. That's where the ITB runs along and attaches into that fibula head. And this is very important when it comes to running because almost exclusively to running in terms of sports, running can cause lots of problems at this ITB structure, which we going to dive in and talk about as we go through this webinar so runner's knee that's why we're all here we want to talk about runner's knee so what is runner's knee well there's two uh, conditions that can be or almost uh, use this term runner's knee in the research now here in the UK, we talk about ITB friction syndrome. I've started to talk about the ITB. So the ITB comes in, it attaches into the outside of your knee. And what happens if we pull too much on that ITB, then it can cause an irritation on the outside of the knee. Typically then in the UK, we call this runner's knee. Very, very common and I say almost exclusively to us runners. Hence, it gets the term runner's knee. But in America, we, we also... Oh, shouldn't say just in America, but a lot of American research I see talk about a different condition being termed runner's knee. Um, and this is what we might call patellofemoral syndrome or patella tendonitis. And this is where we get a problem at the tendon that crosses the top of the knee. The tendon that I mentioned, the patella tendon, is the tendon of the quadriceps. So what happens here is if we put too much force through the quadriceps, then it pulls on that tendon and can damage it. Now, it doesn't surprise me that both of these conditions get termed runner's knee because in truth, 
Um, uh, in clinically, I see about 50-50 of these conditions for runners um, that, that are creating that pain at the knee. So I understand why both can be termed runner's knee. In the UK, we officially term the ITB friction syndrome, pain on the outside of the knee as runner's knee, and pain across the top of the knee um, as jumper's knee. But what you might find is obviously these structures become sore during running, but other typical things I hear clinically are walking up, or more importantly, walking down the stairs or running downhill to be a problem. They are some of the symptoms that we often link to runner's knee. So what I wanted to also outline that runner's knee is a overuse condition. Now, what I mean by this, we have two different types of injury. We have overuse and we have acute injury. Now, acute injury is where we do an instant, we get pain straight away. So you might be walking on the road and you step off the curb and you roll your ankle and there's instant pain, instant swelling, instant problem. That's an acute injury. Now, when it comes to running, yes, we can put our foot into a ditch, but we don't tend to see these injuries as much. It's more what we term overuse injuries. Now, this is where we're doing something a little bit wrong over an extended period of time. So when it comes to running, if we're doing something wrong biomechanically, we then compound this problem thousands and thousands of times. You know, 10, 20,000 steps that we do on our run, we're compounding this problem and over time it causes pain. And that's what happens with runner's knee. Now this is very important to understand because when it comes to acute injuries, it's quite tough for us to do things to, to prevent these. You know, we may step off a curb and roll our ankle, they happen. We may go into a football tackle on the football pitch and there's not much, and we get an acute injury. There's not much we can do to prevent that. But when it comes to runner's knee, there's lots that we can do to prevent it because we can address the kinetic chain. We can stop the problems happening before they present themselves with an injury. So I often describe this to how you'd fix a leak. So if you were at home and you had a leak in your hose and water was coming through, you could plug that leak. You could put something over the top of it and it might stop the water coming through for a period of time. But you know that's not the correct thing to do. Once the rain comes back, the water's gonna come through and you're gonna have the problem. And it's the same thing with injury. We need to understand the cause and not just worry about the effect. Just worrying about the effect would be like plugging the leak. So for example, you could get knee pain and you could stop running. And you might even put some ice on your knee. And that is treating the effect. And it might settle down. But once you go back to running and you start building back the miles, you haven't corrected the cause. And that's the important thing. And that is when we may be then getting a the problem. So we need to truly understand the cause. Otherwise, we're not going to get the, rid of the effect. So we have to, those two things aren't mutually exclusive. We have to work together on those things in order to truly rehabilitate you from the injury. So... What we look, tend to look to do is when we're addressing the injury and working out where the cause is, we look above and we look below the joint. So let me start by looking above the knee because most of the time, or it's probably fair to say a bigger contributor to runner's knee generally across the population is the fact that the hip can become a problem. Okay, so now the hip is a very complex joint. So there's multiple muscles that are crossing the hip that can be a problem. So we have things like the glutes and our TFL. The glutes are our bottom muscles that wrap around the hip and the TFL is the muscle on the side of the hip. I mentioned these two muscles first because these are probably the biggest contributors to ITB friction syndrome. The reason for this, these muscles use the ITB. So they attach into the ITB. So the ITB, as I've mentioned, is fascia. It's a dumb bit of tissue. It doesn't have the intellectual properties of muscles. So you might be saying, I've read, I've heard that you can't change the shape of the ITB, um, which is correct in my opinion. But what we can be doing is working on the structures that affect the ITB. And no two muscles affect the ITB more than your glutes and your TFL. We also have the quad muscles, as I mentioned, a big contributor, particularly to the patellofemoral pain or the patella tendonitis pain, the other version of runner's knee, which are a huge problem if we get adhesions, if we get a lack of flexibility or a lack of strength in those structures. We also have our hamstrings, our groins and our hip flexors all crossing the hip joint. All these muscles need to be addressed when we're looking above the knee to see if there's any problems in that kinetic chain. So we also have below the knee. So when we're looking below the knee, in particular, we're looking at the ankle joint. And the picture that you can see here is of a process that we call dorsiflexion, the amount of movement that you can get your knee over your toe. And the person here is doing what we call the knee to wall test. Now, for me, this is the most important uh, movement 
for runners in general. We need to have this movement because this movement allows us to run or to walk. Now, if we don't have suitable dorsiflexion of that knee moving over the toe, then we get problems that start to move up the chain because we use other muscles to do that or muscles are overloaded in trying to do that. And that can cause a problem further up into the chain and up into the knee. So this needs to be addressed. And this knee to wall test is a vital test for um, you to be doing. So now I have a video which I will put into the description. These can all videos be accessed from our webpage specifically for runners. Um, and that goes through how to assess your own flexibility. And this knee to wall test, I think is very important for you to be doing. We tend to say that as runners, we want at least 10 centimeters away from the wall before the heel needs to lift off the floor in order for the knee to touch the wall. But as I say, I talk about that in a little bit more detail in that video, which will be available to you. So, and these are the muscles, the calf and the soleus, or the gastrocnemius and the soleus, which make up the calf complex. These are the muscles that are contributing or allowing how much of this movement that we have. So it's very important when we're addressing runner's knee that we make sure that there's not a problem coming from below and we appreciate that there's enough flexibility and enough strength from these muscles in order to support the knee. So... That's why we could be getting these problems. So we could be getting um, a problem from above or below. But more importantly, how do we rectify the problem and how do we get back to achieving our running goals and crossing that finish line? Well, the first thing we need to do is we need to identify the restricted structures. So muscle structures that affect the knee that could have developed problems or trigger points or adhesions. And we need to release those tissues to get that soft tissue to be working how it should do. We need to highlight any tight structures, structures that are crossing or affecting the knee that may have become tight or lost some flexibility. And we need to lengthen those structures, return them to their correct level of flexibility. The other thing we need to be doing is addressing any weak or underactive structures. Now, again, I mentioned underactive because it's not always fair to say that somebody's weak. I work with a lot of people who do a lot of exercises. They're not a weak person, but what they've got is they're perhaps not using the muscles correctly. So the muscles that are perhaps should be doing the certain movement aren't doing the movement and other muscles that perhaps aren't designed to be working so hard in that movement are doing the movement. So we get this dysfunction or this muscle imbalance and that's because muscles are under underactive. So what we need to be doing is highlighting which muscles are weak, which muscles are underactive, and we strengthening them or reactivating or improving the recruitment of this muscle. And this is what we truly need to be doing, these three things, in order to be removing runner's knee. The other thing that I always talk about is we need to be allowing the, a progressive return to running. It's no good to rest for a week and then go back into the previous mileage that you did. Remembering this is an overuse condition that has come about because you have compounded a problem by doing something slightly wrong over an extended period of time. So if we go back to just redoing that and we haven't allowed suitable time to correct the problem and a progressive return, if we try and put our body through too much demand, then we're just going to compound the problem again and you're never going to get back to resolving the solution and back to where you want to be. So what we need to do firstly is identify the restricted structures, structures where there's damage to the muscle fibres. What we want to be doing there is locating any trigger points and adhesions in the tissues that could be contributing to your pain. The hot spots to look out for are our glutes, our hips, the outside of the thigh and the upper calf area. So what we're doing here is effectively what we might term self-myofascial release or rolling or self-massage. All these things are designed to be removing restrictions, removing adhesions, removing trigger points. And again, at our running page, I do have a video available around how we should be foam rolling. So, and some of the key areas to be targeting are the hips, the thighs, the hamstrings, the upper calf area, things that will be affecting the knee or affecting the ITB structures. So we want to highlight, uh, the next thing, sorry, we want to be doing is highlighting any tight structures where we may have lost flexibility. So these, um, what will happen, sorry, if we lose this flexibility is we'll be putting extra force on the joint. We won't be able to um, use, these, use these muscles well enough. It will create force on the joint and it will potentially damage those muscle structures because they're not flexible enough. So how do we improve this? Well, this is where we tend to use what we call static stretching. Now we have two types of stretching. We have static stretching 
we have dynamic stretching. But to improve flexibility, we want to be doing static stretching, which is where we're holding a muscle for 30 seconds in an elongated position to activate what we call the stretch reflex and to increase the flexibility of the muscle. And when it comes to static stretching, we need to be doing it for 30 seconds and we want to be doing it regularly. So it's very important that we're highlighting these tight structures. And as you see here, some of the key areas would be the glutes, the calves, the thighs and the hamstrings and that we're making sure these are suitably flexible. As I mentioned earlier, at our running page, there is a video of how you can be assessing your own flexibility. The next thing we want to be doing is addressing these weak or underactive structures. So these are structures that are not able to cope with the demands that you're putting them through. So again, it might not be that you're a weak person, but you're only used to running eight miles. And you might now have been training for a marathon and you're trying to run 18 miles. Your muscles just aren't strong enough for those demands yet. So what we need to be highlighting are which muscles are weak or which muscles aren't recruiting correctly to allow you to fulfill those demands. And we need to strengthen them or correct the recruitment patterns in order to make those strong enough to meet those demands. And this can lead to an area becoming tight or developing trigger points. So that is where we want to be um, making sure that they are strong enough, not developing these trigger points so that they're not putting any extra pressure on the joint. And as I said earlier, we commonly see these problems really come to light. We commonly compound these problems when we increase our mileage. And this might be that you're a new runner or someone who's taken a break from running as well and coming back into mileage where you're just not strong enough and perhaps comparing yourself if you've had a break from running to where you used to be. But unfortunately, muscles do what we call atrophy, which is they waste. And therefore, they're not. we need to go through a restrengthening program in order for them not to become problematic. And we resolve this by strengthening. So common areas to be strengthening are the hip area, the hip joint in general, and calves. Now, the final thing, as I mentioned, is that we need to allow for a, a progressive return to running. Running needs that we can't just dive straight in at the deep end. You won't be getting the benefits of the rehabilitation work that you've done. It's a overuse injury. The more we run, the more likely the chance of reoccurrence. So we need to allow for the adaptations, time for these to take place. Now, what I don't want to do, I'm not someone who just says, go and put your feet up for a couple of weeks and rest. Rest has its place, but this can be active rest. So there's other things we can be doing. You'll see in the picture there. We can be cycling. We can be swimming. We can be cross training. Uh, we can be doing yoga. We can be doing stretching programs. All these things that can be non-weight bearing. So we're still active, but we're allowing the adaptations to occur and the need to recover. Once we do that, we then progressively look to return to running. And I've put here about remembering the 10% rule. And what this means is we shouldn't be increasing our weekly mileage by more than about 10%. So allow for small increases so your body can adapt to this in a sustainable way and not be causing you your pain. And as I've mentioned earlier, we want to be factoring in cross training. It's not just running that makes our running better. There's core work, as I said, there's cycling work, there's flexibility work, there's strength work. All these things combine to make a good runner. So use this time, if you are suffering injury, to be cross training and doing other forms of training that aren't going to irritate your knee and will make you stronger when you return to running. You'll be really glad that you took this time, this rehabilitation time, to get things truly right. One of the worst things I see, and I've been a victim of myself, is allowing a few days of rest and then coming back to running and it's not gone. And then you allow another few days of rest and you come back to running and it's not gone. And you get in this really frustrating, vicious cycle. So that's something we want to avoid. So how can I help you? If, if this has resonated with you, if you think this sounds um, like something that might be going on with you and you want to understand more about your own personal situation, well, we can help you further in a couple of ways. So we have designed a online program to beat runners knee. This is a unique six point program that takes you into our learning portal and guides you through all the steps that I've talked about. So via our video lessons, the things that we will be looking to do is allow you to truly understand what runner's knee is. We will take you through a series of tests of both your flexibility and then your strength work. So we will be highlighting our certain 
structures type that will be contributing to knee pain. We will be highlighting are certain structures weak or underactive that could be contributing to knee pain. We will then go and guide you on how you can increase this flexibility, how you can increase your strength, how you can complete self myofascial work is another module to be really finding and correctly using a lot of these rolling techniques. And so this will be allowing for a progressive return and we will guide you on when it's safe to be returning to running for your own personal situation. Each lesson is taught by myself, so I will be guiding you through and it will be a detailed program allowing that to be specific to you according to your results. And by the constant testing that we do throughout the program, you will be tracking your progress. In each video, we try to give you as much resource as we can. There's me explaining the videos. There's action of me completing the actions that we would want you to be completing, whether it's stretching or strengthening or rolling. There is a summary of each of those, which just has the action in there. We also place PDF documents for you to download to be able to see our typical summary rehabilitation program for that stage of the program, that week during the program. As explained there. Um, so what will this course do? Well, it will teach you on what is causing your runner's knee. It will coach you, as I've said, in these myofascial techniques and pain management. So we discuss things like icing or using supports. We highlight the top tight structures and we will be providing a program for you to increase the flexibility of these structures and we address weak muscles and allow you to strengthen them with both isolated and compound exercises. So this is where we can develop your overall strength and we can also be highlighting your recruitment patterns as well. So we cover that over separate modules. And we will be completing regular testing, as I've mentioned, so you can track your progress. Testing is something that I feel so passionately about because it keeps you actionable. It allows you to track your progress. As we make progress, sometimes it's difficult to remember how we started. And what this does is it keeps you involved in that goal of getting back to running the distances and crossing those finish lines. So we allow for testing to be taking place regularly throughout the program. We also currently have this on offer at the moment. It's a one lifetime purchase of $19.99 and that gives you all of the training modules, all of the video lessons, all of the PDFs, everything that is involved available. And this is available and we will be involved in linking to this for you to be able to see. But it's available for you to sign up and get going right away. So if you'd like to work with us on a more one-to-one -one basis, if you'd like to be talking to me as you're listening to me now, um, we do have our virtual clinic. So in our virtual clinic, we can meet and I can discuss with you your individual circumstances, your individual goals, and get a good understanding of what you're looking to work towards. Then we can be conducting this testing to allow us to be finding which structures of yours are tight, which structures you may be losing some flexibility around. We can also then be identifying which structures are weak or which structures are uh, uh, which structures are weak or which structures are underactive, sorry, to be making sure that we can correct those. We can be looking through the tissue that, that affect the knee and finding if there's any adhesions or trigger points. And I can be coaching you in the self myofascial techniques that I would be doing with you if I was working with you in a hands-on manner. It will then allow me to compile a personalized rehabilitation program for you, which will outline the specific stretches and exercises that you need to be getting back to where you want to be going. OK, and so we appreciate sometimes that a virtual clinic can be a little bit different. So what we do allow is um, a free of charge discovery call where you can speak to myself or one of my team and we will discuss in what's the best option for you. Again, I'll link to our virtual clinic so that you can go over, pop in your details and we can give you that call if that's something you want to do. But just to be clear, that is just a discovery phone call rather than the detail of the virtual clinic appointment that I mentioned. And as I said, that can be seen at johnwsportsinjury.co.uk forward slash virtual. And that's it from me. That's all of the information I wanted to discuss with you. So if you have any questions, I would love to hear from you. I would love to take your questions and I would love to come back to you with some answers. So feel free to drop me a line. Most importantly, I hope this webinar has been informative for you. I hope it's been helpful for you. And I hope it's got you understanding a little bit more about runner's knee and what this is. If it hasn't, drop me a line. Let me know. It'll be great to hear from you. Thank you for your time today and I look forward to working with you and helping you cross that finish line and achieve your running goals.